Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. And we are back with our study through the book of Romans. And we are ready today, as you can see on the screen here, for Romans chapter 4. Romans 4. Good morning, Diana, Jennifer, Linda, Lyle, Pat, Gail, and Brian, and others who are watching and may not be commenting, and that's fine. Glad all of you are here. If you do have any questions or comments, please use the comment section through the video, and I will acknowledge them at the end. Uh, what else? I guess that's it. Romans chapter 4. So let's set a little groundwork again. That's important to do. Remember, Paul's writing a singular letter here, uh, as I pointed out, and I try to point out with every book I teach through uh, that the chapter and verse divisions came much later in time, and at times it it um, it can hinder our our uh, what our full understanding, our our complete grasping of everything that's being written. And you guys know as much as I do that. Uh, hello, Bates and Owsleys. You guys know just as well as I do that we can take a verse out of context. And make it say something that the the original author did not intend it to say. And Romans chapter four is no different. Uh, Romans chapter four is often used to say that man is that that man people anybody is saved by faith. They're saved the moment they believe in Jesus. And they say, "Well, see, Abraham believed God." Verse three, Romans four and verse three, and he was saved at that point. Well, let's set a little background. And uh, we'll move into chapter 4. So Romans chapter 1, Paul addresses the problem with sin among the Gentile world. Romans chapter 2, Paul addresses the problem of sin in the Jewish world. And the reason he does this, the reason he frames it this way. Hello, Danny and Wayne. Good to see you guys on here today. The reason he does it this way is because the church at Rome was made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And there was obviously some uh, trouble, division among the membership there in Rome. And so he, he tells them, listen, Gentiles, yeah, you have a problem with sin. Jews, chapter 2, you have a problem with sin. And what we looked at yesterday, Romans chapter 3, his conclusion, you look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, all men are under sin. But there's a way that they can be justified. See, the law won't do that. The law can't do that. And that's a lot of what Romans chapter 3 is about. However, Christ and his blood can provide justification. Um, now we get to Romans chapter 4, and it seemingly, seemingly, the subject changes, uh, but it's a continuation of the thought. So look here at Romans chapter 4, I'll, I'll just go ahead and put it up here on the screen, verses 1 through 8. Abraham, as a, just, as a model for our justification, he was not an Israelite, nor did he live under the law. And by law, I mean the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. So that's where we're going to start today. Good morning, Miss Louise. Glad everybody's on today. Okay, so the last chapter, um, the, the last part of chapter 3 was asking this question about boasting and justification and law and grace. Um, how are we saved? Well, it's not by our own works. No, but by the law of faith, verse 27. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from deeds of the law. Hey, good morning, Guyton. Man is justified by faith apart from deeds of the law. Well, what law? He's just quoted, I shared with you yesterday in verses 10 through 18 from Psalms, Proverbs, and Isaiah. So you've got the wisdom literature, you've got the prophets, and he calls that the law. It's part of the old covenant. Man cannot be justified by that law. But there is a law of faith, as he says here in verse uh, chapter 3 and verse 27. There is a law of faith, and that is the gospel. The gospel is what saves, not the law. And so, what about Abraham? That's, what, that's where we go into chapter 4. What, what should we say about Abraham? Because the Jewish temptation was, well, we are of the seed of Abraham. The, the, the uh, scribes and Pharisees tried that when John the baptizer came on the scene, as recorded in Matthew chapter 3. And John said, listen... If God wanted to, he could raise children of Abraham up from these stones. That's not what matters. And Paul's going to illustrate that same exact point here. Uh, your physical descent from Abraham, Jews, doesn't matter. 
that's not that that does not um, determine whether or not you're going to be saved. Let me say it that way. So what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? What was his experience in life in, in terms of his relationship to God and his justification? What did he discover? Well, if Abraham had been or was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, there's a couple of words here. If you look at a King James Version, you're going to see this word. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Let me look. Let me just look here real quick. Pull out my King James. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. Okay, it was counted. You're going to see this word counted, sometimes reckoned, sometimes imputed. Um, we're dealing with the same word here. Uh, in the original language. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Have you ever thought about when that was said about Abraham? That verse is, it's, by the way, it's Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Now that verse is quoted three times in your New Testament. Uh, here in Romans 4, Galatians chapter 3 and verse, I think it's verse 6, and then also James chapter 2. Abraham believed God, and it was appointed unto him for, or accounted unto him for righteousness. Hey, good morning, Derek. Abraham shows us today, he shows he showed the Romans, and he shows us today how we are justified. Here's the thing, though. Abraham was not a Jew. He didn't live under the law of Moses. He lived prior to the what we call the Ten Commandments, the reception of the law at Mount Sinai. He, so he was not an Israelite, yet he was justified. See, the Jews in the first century thought, well, and they even tried to bind it on the Gentiles. You read Acts chapter 15, that they needed to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Paul says, uh, basically here in Romans chapter 4, not so fast. That's not what happened. Um, Abraham believed God, Genesis 15, verse 6, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. What we have to consider, though, is when that was stated about Abraham, that was stated long after he was already a faithful follower of God. So here's what people do that I've seen so many times with Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. They will say, well, all you have to do is believe in Jesus and you'll be saved because that's what Abraham did. He believed and he was saved. Wrong. That is absolutely incorrect. When that statement was made about Abraham, Abraham had already been called out of Ur of the Chaldees and he went. Genesis 12 uh, records that. Abraham was already building altars and worshiping to God, uh, worshiping God. Uh, I think that's Genesis 12 verses 6 and 7. Genesis chapter 13 records that same thing. Abraham was already faithfully following God. But he believed God and that was in regard to the promise made to him about having a son there in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6 and it was accounted to him that it was it was put on his credit from God's perspective that he was righteous. All right, we need to understand that and not use Romans chapter 4 as some kind of supposed proof text that all you have to do is believe and you'll be saved because that's not what it's saying. Paul's making a point, to, point here to the Roman church that um, your Jewish descent or lack thereof does not determine your salvation. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace but as debt. Well, contextually, what are the works he's talking about? Well, he's, talk, he's been talking about the works of the law, the law of Moses, and those things don't save. They can't save you. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his work is accounted for righteousness. Hey, Mom. <laughs> Got folks still joining on. Good, good to see you here. Um, so this is what we're dealing with here. Abraham was a faithful follower of God. He believed everything that God told him, and he acted accordingly. That's the biblical definition of faith. I take God at his word. I do what he requires. And uh, that pattern, as it did with Abraham, will follow through my life. That is biblical faith. Um, just believing that God is, that is, I mean, that's a part of faith, yes. But that, that is not the, the totality of or the sum of what it means to have faith in God. All right, that's why we have Hebrews chapter 11. It illustrates that even further. So then he quotes some, again, and Paul does this so frequently, he'll make a point and then he'll, as we should, quote Scripture to prove what he's saying. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. 
Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. That comes from Psalm chapter uh, 32. Um, we take God at His word. We do what He says. It's not that we're trying to work to earn our salvation. That's not it. We're not saved by works in that sense. Nor are we saved by faith alone. We are saved when we have the type of faith that is described here that Abraham had, and we're going we're gonna to develop that thought. Well, Paul's going to develop the thought. We're going to break it down as we go through here. So Abraham is a model for our justification. And then you have verses 9 through 12. He talks about, Paul talks about this blessedness. He says, does, verse 9, does this blessedness, well, that's what he just talked about, whose sins are covered, uh, to whom the Lord does not impute sin, is that for Jews only, or is it also for the Gentiles? Circumcision and uncircumcision, verse 9. Well, for we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? Notice what he says here. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? One thing that we need to understand about Abraham is that all of these promises, his, his, his obedience to God uh, to depart from his family, from Ur of the Chaldees, uh, all of that occurred before he received the covenant of circumcision. That, that covenant, by the way, is recorded in Genesis chapter 17. He was 90, he, well, let's start here. He was 75 when the promises were made to him, uh, recorded in Genesis chapter 12. He was not circumcised until he was 99 years old. The Jewish people had trouble letting go of, again, read Acts 15, letting go of the, 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 um, the covenant of circumcision. They tried to bring it into the New Testament. Paul says you can't do that. Abraham was justified before that even was a thing. Abraham was righteous before that was even a thing, if you want to say it that way. Okay, so somebody asks here, could you explain verses 5 and 6 again? I missed something. I'm sorry. Well, you don't have to be sorry. That's okay. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. What we're dealing with here is, is Abraham's, Abraham being a model of the type of faith that we should have. And what Paul is saying here, the argument that he is making is, um, obviously Abraham was already a faithful follower of God, but he's saying here, as you read verse 5, um, but to him who does not work. See, if we could earn our salvation, the point he's making here, if we could earn our justification by doing enough good things, okay, contextually here, circumcision, that's what's specifically mentioned. If we could earn our salvation by doing enough, then God would be in debt to us. We, you know, we could say, hey, God, you owe me salvation. Paul's saying, no, that's not how it works. That's what we're dealing with in verses 4, 5, and 6. That's not the type of faith Abraham had, and that's not the type of faith we have. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot put God in debt to you. All right. Hopefully that explains what we're dealing with here. Um, so it's a blessing to have our lawlessness forgiven, and it's a blessing to not have sin imputed to us, verses 7 and 8. And so in verses 9 through 12, what Paul says is that same blessedness, forgiveness, uh, not having sin on our account extends to all people who are faithful like Abraham was. And Abraham was just, he was right with God before he was circumcised. And again, this is a big deal in the first century church. It was a big deal in the Roman church because of the division between Christians who came from a Jewish background and um, Christians who came from a Gentile background. We have to keep that context. We have to keep the original recipients in mind here. Um, so verse, uh, well, let's see, we'll start back in verse 10. How then was it accounted while he, Abraham, was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, that's Genesis 17, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Jew and Gentile are saved in the same way. And it's not putting God in debt. It's not by keeping the law of Moses. It's not like any of that. 
We are justified with God when we have the same type of faith that Abraham had. That's the point of Romans chapter 4. He did what he took God at his word and did what God told him to do. Now that doesn't mean Abraham was perfect. And of course none of us are perfect. But there's a difference in being perfect and being faithful, being perfect and being justified. Only God can justify. Only God can make us righteous, but we have to do what's right in order to be righteous. That's one of the points that's being made here too. Verse 12 and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, and here's the key right here, maybe this is the whole key of chapter 4, who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. That's the point. If we want to be right with God, it's not about are you a Jewish individual or are you a non-Jewish individual. It's not about that. It's about how you respond to what God says. And if we want to be right with God, we need to respond like Abraham responded. That's the point of Romans chapter 4. Um, and we can't lose sight of that as we study Romans chapter 4. Hopefully that explained all of that. Verses 13 to 15, the promises to Abraham were not through the law. Remember now, original recipients here. The Jewish people had had the law of Moses for 1,500 years. When Jesus nailed that to his cross, when it came to an end, they couldn't let it go. And so they, they drug, if you will, they drug that baggage with them into the church. And Paul's trying to break that chain. He's trying to get rid of that uh, issue that was existing. So verse 13, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. Remember, Abraham lived prior to the law of Moses, but through the righteousness of faith. And all that means is he was faithful to God. That's why he received the promises. For if those who are of the law are heirs, Jews, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For, that, for where there is no law, there is no, no transgression. And again, I know this, this wording, I, I guess for us, is, is somewhat difficult to understand if we don't slow down and take our time, but... The whole point here is it's not about your relation to the law of Moses. Abraham lived before the law. He lived before circumcision and was faithful to God before that. And yet he was still righteous. Well, now Christians live after all of that and they can still be righteous. So that's his point here in verses 13 through 15. The promises to Abraham were not through the law. That is, through the law of Moses. Paul uses this language frequently in his writing. He'll talk about something, well, he does it in Romans chapter 7 and 8, the spirit versus the letter, or the flesh versus the spirit. And he's making a contrast when he does that between the law of Moses and the law of Christ, the gospel and the Old Testament. All right, we have to understand that in Paul's writings. Verses 16 to 22, Abraham was justified by God's grace and through his faithful obedience. So let's make this point right here. Everyone who has ever been um, right with God, if you want to put it that way. Everyone who has ever been saved has been saved by God's grace and through their faith, through a, through a faithful response to God. No one has ever been by, saved by grace alone, and no one has ever been saved by faith alone. Those two things are not possible. It's by grace through faith, all right? So let's look at verses 16 through 22 here. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who were of the law, Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. It, again, it doesn't matter. Your, your, your heritage, your physical descent doesn't matter in terms of your being right with God. What does matter is, do you have a type of faith like Abraham had? Do you take God at his word and do what he says? And after all, at the end of verse 16, he says, Abraham is the father of us all. Of course, the Jews, the Jews were very prejudiced. Um, you know, they are Abraham. Abraham was their father. Nobody else's. No, well, they missed it. He says, as it is written, I've made you a, I've made you a father of many nations. Um, in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which did not which do not exist as though they did. One thing he's getting ready to talk about here 
uh, further illustrates Abraham's having been justified by faith. And it's in, in, it's in direct connection with the promise of a child. Okay? Abraham was promised when he was 75 years old that through his um, lineage, through his descendants, all families of the earth will be blessed. Well, fast forward 24 years, he's 99 years old and he still doesn't have a son. He had Ishmael through Hagar 10 years when, it, when he was 85, but that wasn't the son of promise. Well, now he's 99 years old in Genesis chapter 20, chapter 21, and he still doesn't have a son. But notice what happens here. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he might become the father, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. He looked beyond the, um, the troubles, you might say, the challenges of his own physical body. You don't have a child when you're 99 years old and his wife was 90. That's not possible. So Paul makes the point here, uh, verse 19, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, that is, not able to have children, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God. God made a promise. Abraham had faith. Abraham was saved then by grace through faith. So think about that. How, how does a child, how is a child conceived? Is it, by, is it by faith alone? Yes, I believe it. I believe I'll have a child. No. Abraham and Sarah had to act on what God told them. They had to act on faith on the promise of God, that, that you will have a descendant, and through that descendant, all nations of the earth will be blessed. That's what Paul's discussing here, and that's the point he's making, um, uh, that, that we should have that same type of faith. We take God at His word, and we act accordingly. He talks about his body was already dead, Sarah's womb was dead, but he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that he, had, that he who had promised was also able to perform. That's the type of faith that we need to have. That's the point of Romans chapter 4. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was put on, that word accounted in the King James Version is the word imputed. And that means God put it on his account. God recognized, recognized him as righteous because he took God at his word and did what God told him to do. That is the definition of faith. That, that is what it means to believe in God. You take him at his word and you do what he says. I mean, you think about it. If you say, well, I have faith in God. I believe in God. But then you don't do what he says. What good does that do? I mean, that's, that's kind of like James chapter 2. Um, a, a mental acknowledgement is one thing, but then acting upon that that. Uh, knowledge that you have, your belief in God, doing what God says, that's what justifies. And it's not me, it's not us working for our salvation or earning our salvation. It's, it's salvation by God's grace and through our faith. That's his point here. And then we have verses 23 through 25. Why is this chapter even written? Well, he tells us. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it might be imputed to him, but also for us. Now, here we go. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. That's why we have Romans chapter 4. We see what it meant for Abraham to have faith, for Abraham to, to be accounted by God as righteous, and what that takes of us. And we, have, we, we cannot lose sight of what you've studied in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 when you get to Romans chapter 4, because it goes, it, I mean, it goes hand in hand. Jews are, uh, Gentiles are under sin, Jews are under sin, chapter 3, all are under sin, and all need to be justified, and that can only happen through Christ. Well, how does that happen? Romans chapter 4, it happens when you have faith in God like Abraham had faith in God. You hear what God says, you do what God requires. I understand the, the wording of Romans chapter 4 can be difficult, but when you keep in, in mind the bigger picture 
of everything that Paul's discussed up to that point, it breaks it down pretty simply, uh, in my opinion. The point is, going back up to verse 12, talking about those who walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had. If you want to be right with God, act like Abraham did. That's the key. Remember, three times in the New Testament, we are told that, that, that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He took God at his word and he did what he said. If we want to be justified by God, we need to take God at his word and do what he says. All right? It's not faith only. It's not faith alone. It's not grace alone. It's a combination of God's grace and our faithful response to that. You know, I think of what uh, the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 5 and verse 9, that God is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey Him. can't be saved apart from doing what God says. Hopefully, that made some sense today. If you have any questions, even after the stream is over, you can access the comment section here. Let me look up here real quick. I just see a bunch of greetings, and I already just addressed that one question. I appreciate you guys being on here today. We had upwards of 30 on the live stream. And showing that through work, Diana said, yeah, I mean, that to, to say that we believe in God, all right, that's one thing. Anybody can say that. But to res And that's the whole point of chapter 4. To respond to what God requires like Abraham did, that's, that's something quite different. Um, man, how many, how many passages could we mention? I mean, one of the simple ones to me is Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I mean, that, that kind of encapsulates Romans chapter 4 right there. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Joni says, God's grace, man's faith, and the middle of that, conditions required. I think that's a fair way to put it, Joni. Um, it's not by anything alone. It's a, it's a combination of all of those things, isn't it? Knowing what God says, what God requires, and... I see... Don't have anything else. Appreciate all of you being on here today. And uh, if you have anything further, even after the stream is over, you'll still be able to access the comment section here. You can send me a private message, however you want to do it. If you have somebody who'd like to do these studies who doesn't do Facebook, send them to our YouTube channel, Mammoth Spring Church of Christ. All that content, all this content is uploaded there and is available. I think we got somewhere around 300 and, I don't know, somewhere between 300 and 350 videos on our YouTube channel. So all this content is available there. All right, guys, thank you for being here today. I appreciate it. We'll plan on coming back tomorrow at 11 o'clock, and we will study Romans chapter 5.